Um, it's been pretty busy. Um, I do lawn care, but in the winter there's no grass, so I've been doing some masonry, which kind of sucks, but at least the weather's been nice. Yeah. You don't do like snow removal stuff also in addition to lawn care? Um, yeah, but we live in Virginia, so there's not a lot of that going on. I mean, we had some pretty, pretty wild snows in, in, um, January and I don't have a four wheel drive truck, so I couldn't get my truck out the lane. <laughs> so I told my customers, yeah, I can't, I can't, uh, get your, your driveway cleared cause my truck is stuck. It's hailing right now in Minnesota. So. For <laughs> professional image. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, it's hailing outside right now, which sucks for me. That's wild. What do you do? Do you, do you uh, just YouTube? Yep. This is my full-time occupation. Just got to 10,000 subscribers, and now I'm obligated to dye my hair pink. So that's what there you go. When's that going to happen? I'm occupation. Probably just got to um, next week, Monday, maybe, because tomorrow I have plans, but most likely Monday. Sweet. Yep. All right. It looks like we are live. So Titus, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time to have a conversation with me. Would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself before we get started? Sure. Uh, my name is Titus. I'm from Virginia, close to Charlottesville. I have a podcast called that Jesus podcast, and we don't do a lot of apologetics, which is why I was kind of surprised that you wanted to have me on. So I'm just curious. <laughs> Where, where you saw my name and how you got a hold of me and why you thought I should come on your apologetics debate show. Well, yeah, I'm just interested in conversations mostly to hearing different perspectives. So I invite on a lot of people. I, th I think I, like I mailed you a while ago, right? Like a long time ago. Yeah, it was like a half year ago. You sent me an email to my podcast email, which I never check. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So I don't remember exactly how I, how I heard about you because it was so long ago, but... <laughs> Nice. All right. So I am an atheist, by which I mean, I believe that uh, naturalism best explains everything about the universe. And so I don't believe there's any evidence of a God. Could you tell me some of the reasons you believe there are for a belief in a God? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, if there's no God, what are all the churches for? And uh, I'm sure you never heard that one before. Tax evasion. Uh, <laughs> and who's, who's uh, Jesus' dad? Uh, I, the, the first podcast I ever created was called proselytize or apostatize. And it was, it was pretty much an apologetic show. And, um, it, it kind of started because, you know, I was, I was just into interviewing people and I noticed that the people, like I got the most views when I would interview people who are not Christians and, and people are more interested in those conversations. And then it morphed into apologetics because I began getting on people who were more qualified to um, come up against the, the claims of Christianity. So I did that for a while, and eventually I kind of lost interest in it. And part of, my, part of the problem was I kind of came to the conclusion that with my biases and with my limited intellect, the idea that I can look at the arguments for and against something like Christianity and come to the right conclusion are, are maybe pretty slim. And maybe that's not even the the tools I should be using to assess whether I should stay a Christian or not. Um, so I've been, I, I kind of just quit doing apologetics for the last two years or so. So I'm probably going to be kind of disappointing here tonight to you. Um, but why, why do I believe in God? Why am I still a Christian? I, I did kind of go through a mini faith crisis after I started debating atheists. Um, but at this point, I'm, I'm pretty settled in my faith. I would say that if I'm going to be honest, the reason I'm a Christian is because my parents raised me as a Christian. <laughs> like, I think that's why I'm a Christian. If I was born in Afghanistan, I'd probably be a Muslim. If I was born in China, I'd probably be an atheist. Um, but th there's some there's other reasons that I tell myself um, that, that are also reasons why I believe I'm a Christian. Now, whether I'm being honest or not, or whether it's just solely because of how I was raised, I'm not sure. Um, so <laughs> maybe not the answer you're looking for, but there you go. Yeah, this is perfect honesty conversation. That's all I'm really looking for. So do you think there's any independent evidence or reason to believe um, that is like a way to show it's not just imaginary? Because from my perspective, I think that most of the evidence for God is pretty much just that it is a 
no different from any other imaginary construct that humans have come up with. And so do you think there's any reason for people to think it's real rather than just imaginary? So by that, you're, I, I guess you're saying that I have the burden of proof, right? Um, and that the, are, are you saying that the default position is that everything is imaginary until proven to be real? Um, yeah. Is, Okay. Typically, I would say that because a lot, most of the things humans imagine aren't real. We, we thought Zeus caused lightning and volcanoes are caused by angry gods and tsunamis are caused by angry gods and leprechauns uh, stole things and witches burned things. So most of the things humans come up with are usually false. Our imagination is not very a reliable source of information. And that's why we have science. Science is like uh, it, it needed a little higher standard of evidence. So it defied created a methodology to differentiate imagination from reality because our mental capacities are not very accurate. So yeah, I think that everything starts as imaginary until we have some solid evidence indicating otherwise. So let me kind of turn the question back on you. Why do you think that throughout most of human history, people have believed in some sort of supernatural entities and why do they still believe that today? I think it's because of type one and type two errors. Um, in evolution, if you, if a, like a, person heard a rustle in the bushes and thought it was just the wind. Like, I'm going to withhold judgment, wait for more evidence and not make a judgment whatsoever. Those kind of people would have been eaten more often by lions than people who always thought, oh, rustle in the bushes, lion, run away, just immediately run away. So because we were more likely to survive if we immediately thought there was some agency or danger in every unknown thing we didn't understand, uh, that caused those people to survive more and reproduce more. And so that belief system or tendency towards uh, seeing agency in everything, a hyperactive agency detection system, is something that's prevalent in humans. That's why we see, we feel like there's a monster under the bread or after we watch a scary movie, we're afraid of the darkness because it feels like there's a monster in the darkness. And the same thing applies to a god. It's like whenever we see something we don't know, because it was evolutionarily advantageous to think it was an agency, we do the same thing in terms of the entire universe and who created us, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I think that most people have religious beliefs and why it's so prevalent throughout time. So why was it evolutionarily advantageous to believe in God? Like what were some of the, the benefits? Well, the advantage is to believe in agency. So if you think there's agency in no, everything. Just God, just God. Well, God is just a kind of agency. So if you have a advantage of one kind, believe in agency, you would apply that to everything, to the wind, to lightning, to volcanoes, to everything. So it, the God belief is just an extension of the fact that it's beneficial to believe in agency for everything. Um, and so it's not like the God belief itself was beneficial. Back in the evolutionary times, it wouldn't have helped much at all. But the tendency to see agency in things benefits. It's like if you think there is an evil spirit in the bushes, the evil spirit isn't doing anything, but it scares you away from the bushes and keeps you alive. So the God belief, even though can be beneficial in that it inspires you to stay away from things you don't understand because curiosity killed the cat um, is true throughout most early human history. So if you were afraid of this thing and it can inspire you to stay away from things you don't understand, that would save your life more often. <clears throat> So you're saying that it's it was an unfortunate part of a package of pattern detection and the package itself was beneficial, but the belief in God was not necessarily beneficial, but you couldn't have the package if you hadn't included belief in God? Uh, sort of, but there can be cases where belief in God can be beneficial. Like if someone says, God says, don't play with dead bodies or whatever, like in the Muslim tradition and playing with dead bodies would get people killed because of bacteria and they didn't understand bacteria. So because it was, there was a negative association with dead bodies and they attributed that to being evil or evil spirits or whatever. Um, because that belief in God then saved people because they attributed this thing which killed them to something like a god. And so there can be cases where belief in a god or any spiritual kind of a being can be beneficial if you attribute that to things that could cause harm. Okay. Do you think that's changed like recently um, where it's less advantageous to believe in God now? <laughs> or are you trying to, are you trying to disassociate belief with God 
from pattern detection in general. Because if, if you're a humanitarian and you want to see the human project flourish, then, and, and you, looking back in time, you say, well, this sort of pattern detection and, and attributing agency to things helped humanity, then either you need to say that, well, now that we're so developed that we can disassociate belief in God from the rest of this pattern detection, um, maybe that's what you're trying to do. Because I'm just curious, like you've obviously dedicated your career to disproving belief in God. Um, but if we came to the conclusion that God exists, like, shouldn't that give you some sort of pause to be like, okay, maybe I'm, I'm turning the clock back. Uh, well, two things there. One is that sort of, we don't need God anymore. Like the things God was used to explain making dangerous, like dead bodies, don't cross your linens, don't eat pork or shellfish. All that can now be explained to science. So we don't need some unknown thing to make it make us afraid of those anymore because the things we can now understand scientifically how they affect us and whether or not things are dangerous or not. And we can assess that independently of our intuit, intuitive guesses. And so we don't need a God thing to tell people, wash your hands before you eat. We know there's germs, wash your hands before you eat. So we don't have the God of the gaps thing where we need a God to act as a motivator for things we don't understand. Cause we pretty much understand most of the things that can cause us harm in our scale of living. Uh, my career, I, I wrote an epistemology and model of morality and my YouTube channel is meant to promote my models. So, so my epistemology, my morality, I just contrast them to religious belief because it's a good, easy way to stay on one topic that can cover all of the range of things that I, I wrote. So, um, that's, that was the foundation of my YouTube channel was the things, my models of epistemology, morality that I wrote. Um, I don't, the last thing you said, I didn't quite understand. I forget what the last thing I said was. <laughs> I think my basic question was if this was evolutionarily beneficial and it got us to this point, why are you trying to combat it now? Is there a reason or is there something that has changed to where it's no longer evolutionarily beneficial for the human race to believe in God? And I, I think you kind of answered that question. Cool. Um, but yeah, to, to answer your question, um, like I said, family of origin, but also you know, as I've gotten older and had to make this, my faith, my own, a, a big motivator for me is how compelling the story of Jesus is. So I, I know this is an emotional argument. It's not a rational one. You're not going to get a lot of rational arguments from me tonight because I, I got very tired of those. And I don't think that's how most people make decisions about their worldview anyways. So like if we want to sit in our, our ivory towers and talk about like the Kalam cosmological argument or something, that's fine. And that's a, a perfectly uh, fine pastime. It's better than playing video games, maybe. Um, but I disagree. With... <laughs> you disagree? Both or because you... I think both. discussing the Kalam is pointless and because video games are good. So both of those. Yeah. Um, I, I just don't think that's the way most people form their beliefs. So when I say that the story of Jesus is compelling, if, if you do want to frame it rationally, you could say, well, there's, I have a prediction that if God exists and Jesus is God's son and God is good, then the story of Jesus will be compelling. But that's subjective. Like, what if someone else says the story of Jesus is not compelling? Um, well, I, I would I ask, I what is it about the story of Jesus that's compelling? That's a, yeah, that's a really good question. So it, it, it's the whole thing. <laughs> but the, the most compelling piece to me is God dying on a cross out of love for his enemies. This idea that evil can be conquered through love. Like right now we have Orthodox Christians from Russia attacking Orthodox Christians in Ukraine. It's absolutely insane. Um, but, I, and I think that's a, a complete rejection of, of Christianity. If we're boiling Christianity down to Jesus Christ and him crucified, at the center of that is God dying on a cross out of love for his enemies. And this idea that evil is overcome through suffering love. And, and that that is the center of the universe. Like the cross is the intersection of, of, of reality. It's, it's just at the very center of the universe is this, is this beautiful um, truth. That's extremely compelling. And then if we zoom out from that, we see all of, of you know, Jesus' teachings and his actions um, kind of um, playing that out further. So for me, when I like... Uh, read the story of Jesus. I don't feel the same compelling that you feel. To me, it seems kind of the same as the Roman stories of their gods um, in that it's a really 
strange thing for like so a very anthropocentric way of trying to solve problems to me it would be compelling like i think my model of morality is very compelling where the best world the best moral world is one where it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing that's something i find compelling so if i found like a book that i thought was written by the the creator of the universe or whatever it would be compelling for me if he understood or could say something like, yeah, the perfect morality is this, that it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing. That's the perfect world. And the fact that the Jesus story doesn't say that it's much more human. It's much more, this is a, a sacrificial lamb. Uh, I forget the fancy word for that. Uh, it's Chris. No, no, it's um, something about putting your sins on something else and casting it out. There's a, there's a specific word for it. Christopher Hitchens used to use it a lot. Uh, I can't remember it, but that seems not as, uh, that seems not as, as compelling to me, not as inspiring as like the story of the best of all possible worlds. Um, it seems very human and small by comparison to me. Did you grow up Christian? Yeah, I was, born into a Christian family, went to Catholic high school, Catholic grade school. So was it ever compelling to you? Like at that point, was it compelling to you? Um, I was a devout Christian at that point, but I think that's because I had major depression. So I was like severely, severely depressed, like suicidally depressed. And I was using God as a crutch, praying to God uh, morning and night for help. And so I don't know I wasn't really compelled by anything in the story. I was more just desperate for the help. And I believed that an all loving being would have given me that help. So I think that's what kept me in the faith when I was a child. Yeah. I mean, I feel like I'm, I'm turning this around and interviewing you, but I have a podcast as well. So I'm, that's about all I'm used to, but that's like, fine. Like that, it's just a open conversation. So yeah. During that time, like, did you have compelling role models who were Christians who were, who are living like what is the sorts of lives you would have imagined Jesus of Nazareth to have lived, or maybe you don't like the way Jesus lived. <laughs> we can get uh, into that. <laughs> maybe. Um, like I, because I had major depression, I had no close human interaction. I think there were people like that in my life. I just wasn't inspired by them. It didn't, it didn't help me to feel better at all. So I don't know what I would have gotten from that. So I'm curious how it unraveled and, and probably your listeners have heard this story already, but I haven't. Unraveled? What unraveled? My faith or like my... Faith. Yeah, so yeah. after praying every day, morning and night for help from an all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving being who cared about me more than anything in the world and him doing nothing to help me for years and years and years, I eventually just lost the ability to believe that there was such a all-loving being that existed. Praying for help from depression? Yeah. Okay. So the the hiddenness of god or divine silence essentially yeah and the problem of suffering i think mostly the problem of suffering because i was in a lot of pain and if it was a perfectly good god it would have done something yeah i mean my my initial knee-jerk reaction is to is to go to the book of psalms and to, to talk about like the long christian history of divine silence and and the what is it the dark night of the soul but I mean, that's not a, that's not an answer. It's it's kind of like the book of Job is not an answer to the problem of suffering. But to, for me, like I would bring it back to the cross and say, okay, God doesn't give us an answer to the problem of suffering. But what He does is comes down to earth and suffers with us and empathizes with us. And that's not that. Once again, that's not an apologetics argument, but that gives me comfort. <laughs> um, I, I can see you kind of snickering there. So. Um, in the chat, uh, Eddie's like, what up, Home Slice? He's, he's acting gangster. He's a super white guy. Um, so I was laughing at him, not you. Um, f when I hear the Jesus story, it doesn't sound inspiring to me. It doesn't sound inspiring to have God come down and suffer with us. It, it would be inspiring for him to create the best of all possible worlds, like a world where it's impossible to force people to do things they don't consent to. Uh, and that to me would be a God that would be like deserving of worship, a God who deserves inspired, a God who sins a part of himself to suffer with us, isn't solving anything. He doesn't, he hasn't fixed anything. He hasn't done anything to improve anybody's lives. He's just essentially just 
what's it called? Virtue signaling. He's virtue signaling to his base. I care too, essentially, but not actually doing anything to solve the problem. And so to me, it seems like the God of the Old Testament is very uh, lazy. I don't know, lazy, shallow, human. Uh, it's not not something I see inspiring for him to come down or send his son to suffer with us. Like something inspiring, he solved the suffering. Like if someone wants to not suffer, just fix it for them. That would be what, what I'd see inspiring. Kind of like... Um, a rich person, if if I'm starving to death and I need food and a rich person has the money and food to just give me, um, and instead of giving me food, they're like, all right, I'm going to give up my food for, for, I don't know, a month or whatever and come starve with you. Like, I don't, I don't care. This is not, this is not helpful. This is not something that I find useful. Yeah. It's interesting. Like if you look at the whole storyline of the Bible, God seems to be pretty determined to do things through, through his bearers. Like the way that he's going to implement his rule on earth is through people. And if people don't do it, like apart from a mere, you know, there are miraculous accounts as well throughout the scriptures, but it's mostly through human beings. So, um, like I, I would put uh, the responsibility for addressing a lot of the suffering on planet Earth simply on the church. Like it, it's a travesty that, that the church isn't doing more to address suffering. But if if you look at it like in in light of eternity, so. If, if it is true that God exists and, and what he says about the new heavens and the new earth and eternal life is true, then the amount of time that like one individual person is on the planet in comparison is extremely short. So if we had these two things on a scale, like the amount of suffering that I, Titus, will endure throughout 80 years in comparison, well, first of all, in comparison with the amount of joy I'll experience, like unless we commit suicide, we all generally think that the amount of joy we experience outweighs the suffering. So in some sense, life is a gift, regardless of the amount of suffering we experience for most people. Um, but even, even if it weren't, like if we believe in an eternity of a perfect bliss in the new heavens and the new earth, when God does step in unilaterally and make all things new, then wouldn't that in some way outweigh the, the suffering we experience? Sort of, it would outweigh it, but it wouldn't make it not immoral. So like, even if I... If I punch you in the face and then give you a million dollars, me punching you in the face is still immoral. Like it would still be the moral thing to do would be just to give you the million dollars, not punch you in the face first. So even if we just consider this life uh, a small amount of pain or whatever, it's still immoral to force people to go through that and not just give them the reward and not just create a world to where they can be happy. And uh, so, so I don't think that comparing our suffering to some afterlife, uh, which may or may not not exist is a good way to try and balance out the suffering that's here to me it would seem like the fact that he has to give you suffering first without your consent is itself evil regardless of what happens after and the fact that the bible seems to miss the mark on what morality is both of those seem to make this a very human kind of like roman story of just the greek gods doing all very human things with with the uh, whatever they want causing war and death and strife and whatever it doesn't seem to be any different from a just a human fairy tale so what's your response to the classic free will arguments that it would be impossible for god to give people free will um without or it would be impossible to have free will without suffering well, i think it's uh obviously provable false so for example the world i described where it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing that world still has free will. You still have all of the desires you have now. Like you can desire, you can covet your neighbor's wife, you can lie, you can use the Lord's name in vain, you can still sin, you can still do all of the evil things that any essential, like a paraplegic, for example, a paraplegic here on earth can't harm anybody. They're stuck in their brain, essentially. But they can have all the desires, so they can still sin, they can still have free will, um, but they just can't hurt anybody because they're physically not able to do so. And so in this so world... So the world here... The world you're imagining is one in which the only law is to not harm someone else, right? In which case there would be nothing else evil, in which case it'd be impossible to do anything evil. Well, no, again, so like paraplegics can sin. There's lots of sins in the Bible that don't involve physical harm. I'm not talking about the Bible. We're talking about your construction of the perfect world. And in, in your perfect world, free will would exist. Yep. Um, but but you would not have free will to do the only thing that you're calling evil. So is that re is that really free will in that case? I don't know what you mean. The only thing you're saying evil is causing harm to someone else in your ideal world, right? Well, it's causing things 
causing people to do things they don't consent to doing. So it may sure. or may not be harm, but sure, that's the only evil thing. And if, if we cannot do that and, and that's the only evil thing, that means we cannot do anything evil. Right. So if that was the only evil thing in my world, you, yes, you couldn't do any evil, which would be fine. I'd be perfectly have, moral world. You would have free will, at least in, in the sense of having the freedom to do something evil. Right. Well, that doesn't make any difference. Like you can't fly, like you can't go outside and fly right now. Right. Sure. So does that mean you don't have the free will to fly? In one sense, yeah, I don't have the ability. I mean, it, I guess this, I guess it depends on how you define free will. So you are saying free will to you would be the ability to either um, move this cup from one place to another or to leave it there, neither of which is an immoral action. Are you saying that's the only sort of free will that the, uh, is that how you're defining free will or are you defining free will as moral judgments? Like the freedom to choose between moral good and moral evil. Is that not important to you, I guess? Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, you could still have that in my world. So the moral judgment. So for example, you could choose to live in a world exactly like this one, like exactly like the earth we live in today with uh, rape, murder, torture, whatever. The only difference is, is that no one could be forced into this world if they didn't consent to it. So if you chose to come to this world, you could be the victim of any of those things and experience all the pain and suffering and experience all of the moral significance of your decisions. The only difference is, is that it would be impossible to force anyone in here who didn't consent to be here. So you could still have all of the moral significant decisions here along with the free will. The only difference is, is that you couldn't force people into these situations if they didn't consent to being a part of them. So your ideal universe is one just like the one we have now, except that before you're born, God is like, hey, this is going to suck sometimes. Um, so you don't need to you don't need to do this if you don't want to. <laughs> is, that sort of. your, is that your only gripe with God that he didn't ask you that? Sort of. Yeah, that would be the significantly more moral thing to do. He's like, would you like to be a part of this world that I've designed with all the pain and suffering and rape and stuff? And I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to go. I'm going to go to my own world and I don't opt out. But if but if you were given the option of, of either this world or no world, you would have chosen this world, right? Well, that would have been immoral too. So both of those, like gas chamber or firing squad, is still immoral. So choosing okay, a... so so we're giving people the option between a world with free will and a world with a world with free will and suffering, and a world with no free will and no suffering. Is that what you suggest God does? No, I Maybe think people should be and, and just for God. <laughs> well, no, no. People should be given the option to come to a world of God's design, or they should be given the option to go to a world of their design. I, I feel like that's exactly what God has done. He just let us have a trial run in his world. Well, if it's an involuntary trial one, that's the opposite of what I'm saying. So, like, it's so we like... we should all be gods. We should all be able to be... No, like, no. We, we come to consciousness, and God's like, all right, you can either come to this world planet earth um it's, it's going to be beautiful and and in some ways it's going to be difficult or you can like do some kind of sim city situation and create your own world and somehow you have all the brains and the resources to <laughs> and desires to construct your own world this is no sounding... god, god's doing all the work here so you you have no extra power god you just you get god gives you a tablet and says what would you like on your pizza your planet or essentially he just gives you the things you like and that's it so it's, you don't have any godly powers you don't have any control other people you're the exact same he, as you are now desires that you have like if if i happen to be in, in a world that i want all the trees to be pizza sure he gave me those desires yep and and then he allows me to either choose his his world or the pizza world sure <laughs> Oh man! So, so you you would rather have a better world? Um, so you you were born into. So if I'm if I'm trying to to frame your argument, you were born into a world um, it, where no, sorry, you are a person who's designed to not like depression, for example, and you think God should have given you the option um, based on that desire to be in a world free of dep depression rather than His world. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I don't, I don't have a rebuttal for that, except it's clearly not what God has done. <laughs> well, sure. That's why so he's immoral. You... That's the problem. So William Lane Craig has this argument about, um, you know, uh, all knowing God. I mean, he, he says it a little more eloquently than this, but an all knowing God by more than we do. So, 
so he good reason as the option um if there were an all-knowing god who did know infinitely more than we did um do you think that would be the case no i think i can prove that false because even if there's an all-knowing god who knows everything we do more than we do or whatever whatever um, there's still a way to do it better because you can still have all of the possible things we don't know about, whatever the sufficient reasons, whatever the benefit is that we don't know about. You can still get it, just make it optional. You can say, uh, I, God, will give you the option to go in this world and have all these unknown benefits, or you can just opt out. That's So you can still have all of that. I didn't really follow that. Can you rephrase right. that? So, so Craig's argument is there may be some sufficient reason to allow for suffering, yep. meaning that there's something we get, some some unknown thing that we get from the suffering, some benefit. Um, and I'm saying, okay, you can still have all of that, but you can make it better. Just make it optional. So I can I can give me the option to be a part of this world and have whatever that benefit is, or have the option to say, no, I don't want that. And now it's in more moral world. So we can still have all of that. We can still have the suffering. We can still have the benefit and make it more moral by just making it optional. Yeah, and I think Craig's response would be that that would be logically impossible in, in some way if, if you knew all the variables, right? Is that what he would generally say? Uh, I don't I don't know if you'd go that route because logical impossibility means it entails a contradiction, like a P and not P, a round square married bachelor kind of a thing. And I don't think there's anything logically contradictory about that. Okay, if we go back to your, your previous um, desire of having the option of being in a different kind of world, uh, I think Craig would probably say that that world is impossible. Like it is not possible to have that, to have the benefits without the suffering. And he would bring in like real life examples of, of ways that we're strengthened or benefited by suffering. Well, so, so I'm, I'm granting that. So I'm saying that you can only get the benefits if you go through the trials of God's world. That's fine. So you yeah. have to go through the trials of God's world to get the benefits. Or you can just say, no, nah, and just say, I'm not going to do it. So you, you, so you get God's world and the benefits if you want, or you can opt out, and that's a more moral world. By opt out, you mean you don't get the world you want. You get no world at all. You just go back. No, to you get the world you want. So getting no but world would just be immoral. It's impossible to have the world you want because you can't get the benefits without the, the suffering. Um, well, hypothetically, we don't know what the benefits are here. So there's some gods, some unknown benefit, but you can still exist. Like, obviously you can exist without being in this no, world. What? With, well, it, with no benefits, because we're, we're saying that the benefits won't come without the suffering. So you're saying you either want to just be like a brain in a vat, just existing consciously, but not experiencing any benefits or any pain, or well, you have it, the opposite of God's world. Well, it can't be any of the things we know about because all the things we know about we can have without suffering. So literally everything here on this world that we can imagine, we can have without suffering. So it can't be any of those things. So we can have all of those in your own world with no problem without the suffering. So it has to be something else, something we don't know about. I'm not sure if that's true. Like, for example, in the winter, I don't work as much because I don't have as much work and I generally don't enjoy my evenings or my weekends as much if I haven't been working as much over the weekend. So there tends to be this sort of give and take in the world where a lot of what we enjoy is because we've been suffering in some way to get it. Like you don't enjoy um, something that's, or, or you enjoy things that are rare or that you work really hard for, um, or even like in like the sense of like uh, working out, for example, you have to suffer a lot to, get a really buff and ripped body. Um, and if you could just get that by by flicking your finger, you probably wouldn't enjoy that as much. Well, you can have that in the world without suffering. So you, like in the world you create, you can have video games where you till the soil, you grind for experience, you play hard video games like Dark Souls. You can have all of that. So if that's all you're saying work is, yes, you can still have that in my world. Just no rape, no murder, no torture, no doing anything without consent. So we can still have all of the work things, all the working <clears throat> out, all the mowing the lawns, no torture, no death. So we can still have all of now, that. Your, your argument was that everything good that we experience, you, you don't need any suffering to to experience those things. And I was I was disproving that argument. I, and then you brought up rape, which I agree. I don't see anything good that comes out of that. But that's not everything good that we, we know of because we don't know that the good thing that, I mean, I don't think anything good, period, comes from rape. So that kind of defeats my argument. But do you, I, I'm just addressing the argument, argument you made earlier 
that everything good we experience, we could experience without the suffering. Right. So by suffering here, I mean things that you don't consent to. If you consent to working out, that's not suffering. You consent to it. So you can get the working out and the benefit of the endorphins without death or rape or torture in that world. You can just get rid of all of it in the entire system of the universe and you can still have working out just fine. So the yeah. things I define as suffering are um, involuntary impositions of consent. So like the the rule I would add to make the perfect world is that it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to doing. And if we can prevent that from ever happening, we can still have all the good stuff, video games, working out, going to jobs, farming, whatever. All of that stuff is still fine. People just consent to it and they never are forced to do it. Okay. I think that's a good rebuttal. Said no Christian ever to Tom Jump after a 30 minute engagement. <laughs> um, let me see other reasons why I believe God exists. Um, well, Christianity has provided me with a profound meaning and purpose. Um, I, I plan to spend my life overseas doing missionary work, and that's like the most exciting thing I could imagine. Um, because there's nothing that thrills me as much as um, addressing physical needs of the world and, and caring for people in, in situations where they're suffering from poverty and other things, and also making disciples of Jesus. That gives me more joy than literally anything else I've experienced. So if you want to kind of formalize this, I guess I would say, well, my prediction is that if God is, is real and Jesus is God's son, then I would experience this sort of pleasure in serving him if he was not real that the the amount of pleasure that i experienced would be kind of unlikely because it's pretty incredible <laughs> like the the amount of purpose and fulfillment that it gives me well i actually agree with most of you most of what you said there like i totally think that working towards the benefit of humanity and fulfilling people's needs is definitely one of the most important things like i i'm working on trying to make an atheist church where our goal is to decrease the cost of living as much as possible because I want to move towards that world I described where it's impossible to force anyone to do anything they don't consent to. And the best way to do that is to decrease people's cost of living. So we're going to start a church with the goal of um, getting like an apartment building. And if it's tax exempt, then we can charge lower rent and decrease people's costs. And like, like you mentioned earlier, the world would be a lot better if churches did that kind of thing and actually yeah. worked to benefit people's lives. So I totally agree with you there. And that's where I get a lot of my value from is working towards growing this um, atheist church business of mine in order to also help humanity. So I, I totally agree on a lot of those things. Did you have to be an atheist to join your church? No, nope, it's going to be like any Christian church. You can just walk in if you want, stay if you want, totally open. No it's membership fees. the local church? Uh, yeah, hopefully. Hopefully we'll be able to grow internationally. Uh, but yeah, probably going to be a local church to start. All right. So what are your worship services going to look like? Uh, mostly like we're going to host debates and conversations. We have intellectuals give speeches about neurology and science and progress in science and talks about uh, what I view objective morality to be and how we can best work towards benefiting people and moving the world closer towards the best of all possible worlds. This is the, the one I described. Um, and do events like I know a lead ballet dancer for Twin Cities Ballet and we can host uh, events like those. Those would be the, the services. So just a lot of interesting stuff to do uh, in terms of talks, TED Talks, debates, lectures, um, concerts, those kinds of things. Do you know anyone else is doing anything like that? Sort of. I know there's six or seven different atheist churches that already exist and different atheist organizations there's a lot of a lot of those, but I know specifically about six atheist churches. One is in Finland, I think. Um, the sec Sunday Assembly in the UK. Uh, there's a few here. The Unitarian Universalists, I think, are one of them. So there's a, a number of one them that do church like things. They usually charge memberships fee though. I don't, I don't like that. I like the way churches do it. You just hold out the basket, and if they want to give, they can. And if they don't, they don't. I prefer that method a lot. And they don't really do as many debates or any of the like event things that I'm planning. They're mostly, they're very churchy, which I'm not a big fan of. Yeah. So part of what you see yourself doing to alleviate suffering is getting people to renounce Christianity, right? Is that the purpose of the debates and the lectures? 
No, the purpose is more just intellectual stimulation. Like I enjoy the conversations. I really don't care if people change their position. It doesn't mean anything to me what you believe. Um, and the goal would be to improve the quality of life for as many people as possible, which would include Christians, Hindus, Muslims. I don't care for everybody. The goal is to make everybody's life better by decreasing the cost of living. So I don't really have any goal of changing people's minds. I, I couldn't care less what people believe. I do the debates because I think they're interesting and I like the conversations and the the discussing the evidences and which position is more supported, those kinds of things. But I don't actually care what people believe. Yeah. So you don't think that there's any benefit in believing God or not believing in God? Do you think the world would be a better place if no one believed in God? Uh, no, I think many people get a benefit out of it emotionally, and I think that's perfectly legitimate reason to believe in God. If it makes you feel good, then sure, you should believe it. I don't have any problem with that at all. Um, the reason I have the debates isn't to... Not true. What? If, if someone doesn't actually believe it's true, but still gets some kind of emotional benefit from them, do you think they should continue? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't know how it's possible, but yes. I mean, I guess... I guess so, like so Harry the Potter. Whole point, like your whole career, your whole YouTube career is just because you think it's fun and it's a way to make money. It's not because you actually think that the world would be better if people did not believe in God. No, I don't think the world would be better if people didn't believe in God. I think that a lot of people get a lot of value from belief in God. The reason I do the YouTube stuff is for to show my model, my epistemology and my morality and to show how I think they're better than a lot of the religious models. But I don't care what people believe. I think if... You should believe whatever makes you happy, and that's more important than whether or not it's true. Okay. Because part of my, my work is going to be actively trying to get people to become followers of Jesus, because I think that when that happens, the Spirit animates people to live uh, lives that are beneficial to their fellow humans. And I think that a lot of Christians, unfortunately, don't experience that. <laughs> I mean, we have all of Christian history to point that out. But then we also have examples like St. Francis of Assisi and Mother Teresa and these shining examples of people who've, who have been animated by the Spirit to alleviate suffering. I'm, I'm curious, like, do you have examples of those, of, of atheists who've done things of, of similar magnitude? Well, I would list the scientists who have saved uh, millions and even billions of lives from their scientific work. That's usually more where the... What? Atheist scientists? Yep. Atheist scientists who've made progress in scientific fields who did lots of things like Einstein was did not believe in a personal God. Um, there's many scientists, I don't because I don't really think about them as their religious belief, but there's many atheist scientists who've made progress in doing things that benefited people's lives and saved millions of lives, far more so than any religious figure did. And I think those are that's more of the kind of inspiration that religious people do or that the spiritual that non-spiritual people do to benefit others' lives is to make progress technologically. Um, like if we list all the computer people, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, um, all those people, all atheists, or not Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, I think was an atheist. And all the people who invent the things that make our lives significantly better today are predominantly atheists. I don't think that's true, but I don't have any stats in front of me. Do you have any stats? Uh, Nobel Prize winners, most Nobel Prize winners are secular Jews in a lot of ways. The people who run academia are predominantly atheists, and the National Academy of Science, 97% don't believe in a God. They reject a personal God. In the Royal Society and the National Academy of Sciences, uh, that's the case. So it's like single-digit percentage are God belief, and that's the leading scientific institutions in the world right now, the two leading scientific institutions and you in the believe world. That, and you believe that science is the field that is doing the most good in the world to yes. alleviate suffering? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's Norman Borlaug. So Norman Borlaug is the guy who invented genetically modified wheat. He's known as the man who literally saved a billion lives. Uh, yes, science is, science is that thing. Nice. Well, there were plenty, I mean, science was started by Christians, a scientific process, um, but yeah, you are probably right that the majority of them are atheists. I mean, maybe you should provide some citations for that, because maybe some Christians listening is like, that's not true. Um, yeah, there's but, a poll, uh, Pew Surveys Data of Science and Belief, I think is what it's called, and it shows, it's the one I'm talking about where it says that the top scientists, 90-something uh, percent, are are atheists. It seems a little elitist to say that the people who are doing the most good are scientists and, and they're atheists and therefore like atheism is superior like that. Most people will not become scientists. And I think that 
sort of the cascading effect of a ideology that influences the masses probably will have a, a larger cumulative effect, wouldn't you think? No, because I mean, the like a, the example I gave before, Norman Borlaug, he himself and his team saved a billion lives on their own. The cumulative effect of every single Christian nation combined didn't do as much as he did on his own. Um, so I don't think so. And that's not listing scientists that are atheists who invented computers. Computers have saved probably equally or more lives invented by mostly atheists. Uh, most of the technology around us invented by atheists. Um, so I don't think so. I don't think that the cumulative effect of a large number of Christians would even compare to the slight advances in technology like Norman Borlaug, uh, genetic modified foods, penicillins, uh, vaccines. I think those things on their own, the inventors of those things have saved more lives than pretty much every Christian who's ever lived. Have you um, read Tom Holland's book, Dominion? Sounds familiar. Okay. It's really interesting. You should read it. He, he's kind of makes the argument that even the secular West has been so thoroughly marinating in Christianity for 2000 years that like even like the Black Lives Matter movement or movements that a lot of times conservative Christians are opposed to, they wouldn't exist if, if it wasn't for the fact that our society has been marinating in the story of Jesus for 2000 years. Like before before Jesus came on the scene, the idea that we would want to be identifying with an oppressed people group was absurd. Like, no one wanted to be the oppressed back then. It was basically like might makes right. And and we've seen that shift in the last 2,000 years. And I think that's, that's a profound change that's taking place. Well, I agree that's a profound change, but I don't see it having anything to do with Christianity. Um, specifically, like... Most of those ideas predate Christianity and Jainism and Hinduism. Jainism and Hinduism are older than Christianity, and they share the same ideas. The golden rule comes from Hinduism. Jainism is even more pacifistic and moral than Christianity is. They are they take all life seriously. They say you should have a cheesecloth over your mouth so you don't swallow a fly because they have moral significance. So they are complete nonviolence. They were the they took the turn your other cheek before Jesus was Jainism. So all these moral things I see is things that happen in every society. Like Black Lives Matter isn't unique to America. It's the same kinds of organizations have existed all over the world in China, in uh, Russia, in India. They all have these kinds of demographics of people who take the lower stance of society and see them as valuable. Like the Buddhist monks, uh, Doc Fan, I forgot his Tao Duck Fan or something, the guy who lit himself on fire with gasoline as a protest for, as a peace protest. Like the Buddhists have taken that position that they should always uh, not adhere to wealth and should be low, lowly in society and appear and value not money and monetary things. So all of these things don't originate with Christianity. They originate from other societies. And I agree with you that there's been moral progress in society, that we've moved more towards caring about those. But that seems to be, again, not something from Christianity, but from society in general. Like we can see moral progress happening in every society, and it seems to be a pattern based on the amount of resources you have and the amount of intellect you have as an ability. As your intellect yeah. and resources grow, your scope of morality increases. You see more things as having moral significance. That's why veganism is a thing. Veganism isn't from Christianity, um, but veganism is the same pattern of the scope of morality changing to include smaller things. And so that's just an innate part of humanity. I don't think it has anything to do with Christianity. I don't think that's historically accurate. Um, Which part? I would, I would suggest reading Dominion by Tom Holland. He's actually he's just an atheist, I believe. He's completely secular. He's from the UK. And he has a really thick historical account of how Christianity has shaped culture, how the, the story of uh, a God who laid down his life for his enemies has, like our culture has been so profoundly marinated in it for 2,000 years that it's, it's shifted um the the moral conversation like you you mentioned india um yeah there's certainly a lot that can be commended in hinduism and pl actually planning to, to fly to india next week um but there's also some pretty disturbing things like reincarnation um causing people to not really care about the marginalized like you know you're 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 poor or you're in a low caste simply because you did something wrong in a previous life um and a lot, a lot of that changed when christian missionaries came like christian missionaries 
overturned widow burning and a lot of other things like that. And sure, missionary missionary work has been tied to colonialism and has done damage as well. But like if you go to a lot of um, countries in the East, hospitals and universities, a lot of them were started by Christian missionaries. Um, would you would you agree with that? Sure, but that's true all over the world. Like a lot of hospitals are started by lots of missionaries or religious people or organizations. Like a lot of them today are started by humanist organizations. Um, you mentioned a few it's things like there, like a tiny fraction compared to Christian organizations, like a tiny fraction. That's because they haven't been around for very long. Cause only 200 there's years lot, ago, we were being, atheists were being killed 200 years ago. So that's not like we haven't had a lot of time to catch up and we're already doing a lot. So, but you mentioned per capita, per capita, if you're including atheists in China, I'm pretty certain it's, it's a far um, lower ratio. Uh, no, because all of the hospitals in China are started by atheists. So that actually increases the amount started by. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about hospitals started in your own country for um, financial good. I'm talking about like going to a country that has no hospitals and no development in that way and, and doing that pioneer, you know, philanthropic work. Well, again, China does that too. It's not China isn't all 100% evil people. So yes, that would also increase the probability. But you mentioned the dying and rising thing. Like there are dying and rising gods in every culture, like Inara in Hinduism. I feel like you didn't really, you didn't really address my argument. What argument? My argument is that if you look at the population of atheists in the world, including China, I'm not, I, I agree most of them are the, the vast majority are not evil people. I, I have Chinese friends and they're wonderful. The, the government is pretty evil. Um, but like if, if you include them in, in the population of the world's atheists and then calculate how much of that sort of work is being done by atheists versus Christians, I'm pretty certain that um, Christians would come out on top. Well, again, the atheists are the ones doing the technological gain that save all their lives. So I don't... That's what we're talking about. We talked about that earlier and I conceded that one. Well, well, that's the point is like if as an atheist, we see those as more important. So we invest more time in doing those than actually going and doing the church work. Like we'll save more lives from making technological I'm progress. Church work. I'm not talking about church work. I'm talking about going to developing countries where there's a lot of physical suffering and alleviating suffering through starting universities and hospitals and that sort of thing. Right. And again, the atheists see more value in developing technology because it does better at saving people's lives. So, so it's not as much of a philanthropic um, benefit to go there and do those kinds of things because there's better ways to help those people by improving technology, by uh, increasing the accessibility of certain kinds of foods. Um, those things do more to help people than simply going there and building a building not as beneficial. Thank you for the super chat. Udu coat. So, so I mean, because I think that there are better but ways to help them. That, I, I mean, I don't really disagree with that now. I'm not sure that was the case in like the 18th century, but it's, I, I think it, it could be the case now. But once again, that seems a little elitist because there's a tiny fraction of people that are going to be these scientists who, who save billions of lives or millions of lives. Like that's a, a handful of people. And, and, and the, the cascading effect of millions of people or billions of people doing small acts of kindness, I, I think is, is I, don't, I don't know how we can calculate this like mathematically, but it's certainly not insignificant. Like Jesus tells a story about the, the poor widow who gave more than, than all the rich people, right? And mathematically that's not true, but I think that, that it, it, there's a powerful, a powerful truth there um, that, you know, the, the cumulative effect of millions of acts of kindness is pretty incredible. Well, because it also sure. As well. Sure. But I'd say like the atheists where Christians give a lot of money to churches, atheists give a lot of money to science and technology. They invest and donate to scientific organizations more so than, uh, charitable organizations. And that's what helps with a lot of the science stuff. Also many of the about Western, <laughs> Western atheists, all of them, even Chinese, Chinese atheists invest a lot into science as well. Like the science is a big thing for all atheists everywhere in the world. Um, and so also humanist organizations, especially in the West are prevalent. Like humanists do more charitable work than they do organizational work. Like churches do a lot of going to church on Sundays where humanists do mostly charitable work in their, in their organizations. They don't do the, the church thing. So most of them, most of the atheist organizations do mostly um, charitable work. 
uphold as opposed to churches. So again, it seems like if the world was essentially, if Christianity was replaced with just atheism and you would see probably more charitable work, more things that were done, the and more impact on people's lives. The world, I think, would be better if more people had the same mentality as the atheists. But I don't see Christianity as bad. It does good overall. It just doesn't do as good as the atheists do. I still think the atheists do better in pretty much everything. Um, lower crime rates, lower rape rates, higher education rates, um, better quality of stand, quality of living, higher health rates. Pretty much every statistic you could go off of, the entire world would be better off if they were mostly atheists because they seem to build better societies. <laughs> um, and, and you're talking about Western atheists again with all those statistics? No, that includes China and Russia and even North Korea. Like every single atheist society, if you take the average, is better than the religious societies. So you have studies that include studies of China and North Korea and every atheist society. Studies like, well, we have poll data, uh, birth and death rates, education rates, I guess you could call those studies. But yeah, if we compare, um, all Christian societies, including the ones in Africa to all atheist societies, atheists win every time. Like if we, so if you want to include the worst atheist societies and we include the worst Christian societies, atheists win. And if we don't include the worst atheist societies and include just Europe, atheists win. So either way, atheist societies do better. Yeah, I mean, of course, you need to factor in poverty that really has nothing to do with, with someone's choices, right? So, like, it, someone has a lower life expectancy in Africa that has nothing to do with their choices. Yeah, it would have to do with a society, and does the society value science and technology that then benefits their lives? So, if you're in a society that values science and technology, then you're more likely to be less poor, which will have a better impact on society. And so if you, instead of valuing going to other countries and building churches, you value becoming a scientist or a doctor, and a lot of them become scientists or doctors, then your society will do better because you didn't go off and become a missionary. Instead, you stayed at home and built technology. So if Kenya became atheists, they would value science more and would soon become a very developed nation. Is that Tom Jump's argument? Yeah, that's definitely the case. Like you mentioned how uh, reincarnation makes people not care about the poor. Well, the, the same is true of Christianity because you think of this afterlife, you don't value people in suffering in this world as much for the exact same reason. Like as you mentioned, well, if it's if we compare the suffering in this world to uh, infinite lifetime afterwards of joy, well, then the suffering in this world really isn't that bad. Um, and so just like how reincarnation can devalue the human life here on earth, so does the Christian afterlife. Whereas humans don't have that. We value the life here more than anything else. We value people's suffering here more than anything else. And so we're more likely to care about it and to try and prevent it. So you, you said you had studies um, and, and data that proves that all atheist societies as a whole are have been better than than Christian societies. Did that include the Soviet Union? Yes. Like so how if, far back? How far back? Uh, the Soviet Union still been around. It was only around for like fifty years or so after Lenin and Stalin. So even including those, it's still better because again, Christian nations. What are, what are these studies? Just Pew survey data of quality of life, standard of living, education level. We're just going off of the standards that we use to measure how good a country's living standards are. Do you have, I mean, I don't know if you have links right off, but like, do you have an actual citation for that? Uh, yes. I have to pull it up. That was in my debate with Kenny Boomer, I think. Move that down. Uh... Debates, debates, desktop two, uh, live debates, Kenny Boomer. If you are curious to which states and governments have the most least religious, simply check out the Pew Forum Religious Landscape Survey. It's all there. And so it's the Pew Forum Religious Landscape Survey. That would be the citation. And then you can go ahead and check out the various states and are faring in terms of social well-being. The correlation is clear and strong. The more secular tend to fare better than the more religious on a vast 
host of measures, including homicide, violent crime rates, poverty rates, obesity, diabetes rates, child abuse rates, educational attainment levels, income levels, unemployment rates, rates of sexual transmitted disease and teen pregnancy, etc. You name it on nearly every sociological measure of well-being. You're most likely to find the more secular states with the lowest levels in faith in God and the lowest rates of church attendance faring the best and the most religious states and the highest levels of faith in God and rates of church attendance faring the worst. So I could believe that if that was just a survey from like the last five years, because you know, a lot of Nordic countries are, are doing pretty well. But like if that included the Soviet Union and communist China, that would be a little bit shocking to me considering how massive the, the populations are there. Well, again, that would only apply if you only take into account those years. If you take into account the previous years, the Crusades, the Hundred Years' War, all of the famines and death from caused by religious organizations, it still lends that atheists are doing better off. Like, today we are in the most secular time and have had the most peace. Like, there's the only war in the past hundred years between major nations has been Ukraine and Russia. So the more secular the world becomes, the more peaceful the world becomes. Oh, he froze. Hey, you lost connection? Hey, sorry, lost you for a sec. No problem. Anyhow, um, we can move on, I guess. Um, did you did you find if, if everything you were asserting about that study was correct? Did you find the study? Yeah, it's the Pew Research Study. So Pew, Pew, have you heard of Pew? It's one of the most... Yeah, I have. I'm trying to find it. I can't find it. That's the... Pew Forum's Religious Landscape Survey. All I'm seeing is data on the United States. I'm not seeing anything else come up when I Google that. Yeah, so there's the ones for the United States. Um, you do Pew World Religious ones, but... Global Religious Landscape. heard a baby thank you for the follow agent 258 appreciate it oh did he freeze again I think he froze again is it me I don't think it's me You freeze again? Yeah, whenever I Google something, you freeze up, and then I have to refresh the window, so maybe I'll stop doing that. Okay. The atheist God protecting you from me just freezing. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think about mystical experiences? Like, what if there was a portal into another dimension that can only be accessed through mystical experiences that are subjective? Like, is, you can't really disprove that, right? Well, if there was a, a portal to another dimension, that would be great evidence if we could access it in some way. Um, as far as I know, mystical experiences are... So the evidence are the mystical experiences and they're subjective to individuals. So you can't really provide evidence that someone else can only be experienced personally. Right. So I think those would probably be best explained by hallucinations or delusions or uh, different kinds of communal reinforcement. So I don't think those are evidence of a God because those can all be explained by things we already know about in psychology and neurology. Um, if you could like make novel predictions and that would be great evidence. Like if there was this other way that you could learn something about the universe in some way 
and have access to something we don't know about yet. Like if you could talk to a ghost, for example, and the ghost could tell you where the buried treasure is or something, that's evidence. That counts as real evidence. But if it's just you had an experience, that wouldn't be evidence. That would just be like epileptic seizures happen all the time in people, small ones and large ones, and those cause religious experiences. So it wouldn't be evidence of uh, it being real, especially because there's a lot of evidence on hallucinations and delusions are a result of prior held beliefs and deeply held beliefs. So like bereavement delusion is a big one where you see and hear and can touch dead one, love dead ones. And like this is 60% of the population experiences bereavement delusions. So the fact that you see or hear or dead loved ones isn't evidence of a supernatural realm. It's something we know about from psychology. Um, same with like uh, big miracle events. Like I forget the one there, there was one in Mexico where like thousands of people saw the sun move or whatever. That's from communal reinforcement. Communal reinforcement is kind of like how a, a wicker board, if everyone's touching the wicker board and it starts to move and it starts to spell out letters and no one can explain it because it's not anyone in particular doing it. It's the subconscious mind trying to fill in the blanks. Um, and the group then makes up an explanation. It was a ghost or as my aunt Carrie or whatever. So all of those different kinds of spiritual experiences can be fully explained by psychological facts in the human brain. So if there were, you need could some new not, kind. Could that not all be true and there also be mystical experiences that are a portal into another dimension? Sure. You just need some reason to believe that is more than just imaginary. And I don't think there is any. Well, if these experiences are convincing to the individual experiencing them, like... Do, uh, by evidence, do you mean something that you that someone else can be convinced by, or can you be personally convinced by it? Well, it's any way that can differentiate imagination from reality. So it doesn't matter if it's empirical or some other method. Any method that can do that would work. But I don't know of any method that can do that that can verify spiritual experiences. To me, it seems like it's just um, probably just psychological. Like all of the evidence indicates it's just psychological and I don't see any reason to believe it's more than that. And you would need that to make it evidence. And you're saying that the evidence we have for the psychological realities, like, um, are you talking about like people studying the brain and, and what processes occur in the brain? And since we can see that and test that and under a microscope that that's certainly real. And if we have no way of differentiating mystical experiences from that, then we should always assume it's that. Sort of, it's more like we can know the hallucinations are real. We know where they happen in the brain. We know they're false. We like the people have hallucinations, not just about religious experiences. They have, there are people who have had visions of Santa. They saw, they thought Santa came and visit, visited them in the night. And we know that these happen due to previously held beliefs. So like the Santa thing happens to kids mostly. Mostly it's kids who see visions of Santa. And mostly it's people who are in America or Christian nations who see visions of Jesus. And it's mostly in Hindu nations who see visions of Vishnu. And so we know a lot of them, like if you see a vision of Zeus or something, we know that's false because Zeus doesn't exist. So if you see a vision and it's contingent on your culture, and it's, we know there's many cases where they're provably false and we can see the same phenomenon happening in Christian nations or Hindu nations or whatever. Um, and it's just for their particular God, which we can't prove false. Then it's most likely that it's the same kind of hallucination in both cases. So in that case, there would be no way of having any sort of mystical experience that could be, um, helpful in, in as evidence for there being a, uh, something behind it, right? Is that what you're saying? Well, no, there could be a lot of them actually. So how could uh, you differentiate them? What would be an example of a way to differentiate? So novel prediction. So if you said, I know my invisible spirit named Bob is in my basement and we can prove Bob exists because he will get me a glass of water and levitates the last glass of water in front of you or whatever, that would be good evidence of Bob. That would be a spiritual I'm experience. Not sure I'm not sure that's a mystical experience anymore. <laughs> That's more like a miraculous experience. I don't, I don't know what exactly the difference would be there, but any novel testable prediction. So if he could tell you where buried treasure is hidden or tell you facts about the universe. Have you seen the movie K-Pax, Kevin, Kevin Costner? I think no. Kevin, Kevin Spacey, where he gives you math to describe the universe that just blows everyone's minds. Like that would be good evidence. So if it, if it gave you some insight into knowledge we don't have yet about the universe, um, that would be good evidence. But you obviously you couldn't just have an experience it'd have to do something that could tell us something else about the world we don't know yet and that we could verify so 
my mystical experiences generally profoundly shape the way I act that day or that week and for the better. Like I'm a much better person, a kinder person, a more peaceful person. Um, I guess you would explain that just in natural terms, like any form of meditation does that? Sort of, yeah. I would say that there's a lot of studies on cheating and helping people. Like if you have people read the Bible before taking a test, they are less likely to cheat. If you have people read, I don't know, uh, Nietzsche or something before a test, they're more likely to cheat. So if you give people positive emotional associations with something, then they're more likely to treat people with kindness. They're more likely to give to charity. They're more likely to give money to like a poor guy if they walk past on a street. And the same thing applies to any motivational moral feeling. So if you watch something that makes you feel good, like a Disney movie that has a moral uh, theme to it and it's give to charity or be kind to, uh, I forget the, no, something Dwarf of Notre Dame or something, Hunchback of Notre Dame, then you're more likely to give to charity. You're more likely to treat people with kindness. And so different kinds of stimulus can cause people to act more morally as long as it is associated with kinds of moral tendencies. Yeah, and I guess you could say that's because it's it's a principle that God has put into the universe um, that all, all the other forms of meditation that work are reflections of true meditation on the scripture, or you could just say that it was evolutionary beneficial. So you kind of go both ways there. Yeah, definitely. I would go the evolutionary beneficial route in that <clears throat> the neuroplasticity thing where if you're... Yeah. If your brain is activated in a certain way, it causes those kinds of the things associated with that way to be highlighted. So if like if you're in a bad mood, bad things seem to happen uh, in sequence because you notice them more if you're in a bad mood or you're more likely to do bad things if you're in a bad mood. So the, the mood you're in and the things that cause you to be in that mood can be ref self fulfilling prophecy and how that impacts how you act and see things going forward in your day or your week or whatever. We should talk about miracles, but I'm a little disappointed that you haven't insulted me yet. I was told on Facebook that you would call me names at some point. You have a silly hat, sir. <laughs> You're going to pull that out. I, I remember, so the, the only times I've heard you debate really before you invited me on and I looked you up a little bit was on modern day debate. And I remember this guy with just kind of this low raspy voice, just like, calling the other person every imaginable name possible i think it was you was that you have you changed your style or what's going on because you've been pretty nice so far well most of my debates are like this there are some that really piss me off and then i start yelling at people but you're a nice guy you're fun to talk to so i'm not there's no reason to yell at you right. but like, yeah if you see my like darth dawkins debates like oh my god i hate that guy that guy that guy annoys me i'll definitely scream at that guy all right well are christians or atheists more likely to scream during debates I don't know. I mean, because there are a lot of bad Christians, so. <laughs> this is very true. Um, but I'll pull in no true Scotsman and say they're not true Christians. Yeah. Uh, let, let's, uh, let's talk about miracles. So my wife, when she was a teenager, had a tooth that was twisted 180 degrees from where it was facing the opposite direction of what it should face. And she was getting a lot of treatment for it. And eventually the doctor was like, yeah, we're just going to have to pull it. And she really didn't want to have it pulled. So her charismatic mom took her to a prayer meeting and they prayed for hours that, or for a while that it would be miraculously healed. She goes to bed. Next morning she wakes up and like her gum is really, really sore. And she's like, wow, this is weird. Goes to look at her and it's twisted 180 degrees facing the right direction. And like she freaks out, her mom freaks out, the doctor freaks out. So either she's lying to me or she's misremembering her and, and everyone else in her life are misremembering something this concrete um, or a miracle happened because I don't think there's any natural explanation for that. So this is one example of, of many, many miracle claims. Um, how would you respond to this specific example? Well, there are actually natural explanations for that. Like your tooth can get caught in such a way that if it's, if the back of your tooth is stuck on a tendon or something, then it can be twisted. And if it gets released from the twit, from the tendon, it can twist the other way around. So that would explain why it was sore that night. 12 what? hours. 180 what? degrees in 12 hours. Yeah. So if the tooth is like stuck on something and that's what's causing it to be twisted and it releases from the thing, it'll just go... So it's like a tendon I, or a I muscle. Google, I would Google this, but I'll probably drop the call if I do. Do you have 
Do you have any citations for or any other examples of a tooth twisting 180 degrees in 12 hours? Like I can how, check before. Have you heard of this happening before? Uh, rotation can also be faster if you have gum disease that loosens it. So yes, by there are cases. By faster is it 12 hours? Yes. I don't know. Right. I, don't, I don't see the time period. Rapid right, well, correction of rotation. Yeah, we need a time period here. Uh, Where's Jamie? We need Jamie to look this up. <laughs> yeah, need a need a, a person to do all of the research for us. Yeah, so uh, this one it says benign tumors or cysts can cause that, and if you pop the cyst, it can reallocate the tooth. Um, so this would there would have needed to be a tumor in the gum for this to to take place, and. It, Number one and number two is this in is cyst. this in eight twelve, 12 hours is cyst was this in twelve hours? Uh, I don't see the time frame. They don't like bring it up much. We need, we need a time frame. Well, they just don't talk about it that much. It's not like it's. Well, I think it's because it's so absurd that it would happen in twelve hours. <laughs> if it happened in twelve hours, I'm pretty sure it would come up on Google. All right, let's call all the atheist hordes making fun of me in the comments to look this up and give us an example as well. Spontaneous changes in the rotation of premolar teeth. Fifty cases. How old? They say this one says age fifteen. How old did you say she was? Seventeen? Fifteen? That age, yeah. Would take between six to twelve months, is what I'm saying. Pretty sure this isn't a thing, man. Well, I'm, I'm sure. reading a paper about it. Spontaneous changes in the rotation of premolar teeth from the eruption until the established deten I don't technical terms, I don't know what those mean. This wasn't a molar. This is one of her front teeth. Well, I I don't know if the teeth matter. Yeah. I can't get access to the paper because it requires pain. But well, if someone can find an example of a tooth turning 180 degrees in in 12 hours, I will eat this hat that you insulted. Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's not a thing. Well, the one I'm reading is from Oxford Academia, European Journal of Orthodontics. Spontaneous changes in the rotation of premolar teeth. So it's a thing. So a teeth rotation, it's spontaneous, which means fast. Spontaneous is just without any other intervention. So spontaneous changes in teeth rotation is definitely a thing. And the right age range too, age 15. And there's 50 cases that are just in this one paper. So it doesn't seem particularly rare. Thank you for the super chat. Uh, Adam, 10K well-deserved subs. Congrats. Thank you. I'm going to have to dye my hair next week. The 10K subs. Garrick, there is a link between how religious a society is and their IQ. Maybe smarter societies do better. And it has nothing to do with religion. Um, sort of? So, Yes. Secular societies have a higher IQ. Higher IQ societies have better off. It doesn't specifically have to do with religion. 
could be a coincidence, but that's fine. Either way, I think the point is the same. Oh, your black screen I can't not see you. Oh, now I can see you. All right, my internet's crappy. I might have to use my phone if this keeps happening. Um, did you find anything? Well, just this article. I can't access it because it's a uh, paywall, but it literally says all of the things you are saying. Not in 12 hours. It did not say that. Well, spontaneous <laughs> means like super fast without any cost. Spontaneous would be on its own. I don't think that has to do with um, like speed. Now we got to go to dictionary.com. I do have, have go what, ahead. yeah, I do have a, uh, a cracker that can crack these and get me access to some academic papers. I can yeah. try that. Sci-hub. Sci-hub. Yeah, I mean, I've heard of teeth moving. I mean, that's and spontaneous, I think, would probably mean like without braces or without treatment, but certainly not in 12 hours. Well, I don't like, think so, because... Like, that, that's freaky, dude. Like, how... Well, teeth moving happens all the time. Your teeth always move. Um, so it, it probably wouldn't use sure. spontaneous just... 180 degrees in 12 hours. Okay, that way. I'll have to try it later or get one of my friends who actually has an academic profile to unlock it. But to me, it seems like, yeah, this, there are examples of this. Well, if you find them, can you put it at the top of the comments in YouTube, the link? Yeah, the uh, the pinned the comment back. thingy, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, because that would be pretty incredible if this is a normal occurrence. But then you'd still have to factor on the the coincidence of it happening right the day before she was going to get it pulled right after a prayer meeting. So, I mean, that would take the likelihood down even more that this was a natural explanation, but if it's happened before, certainly it's, it's less miraculous. Uh, I just don't think it's ever, there's evidence that it's happened. Yeah. To me, like it doesn't seem like, uh, what's it called? Spontaneous remission of diseases happens all the time naturally. Um, and people go to prayer meetings and then the spontaneous remissions happen after a prayer meeting and they attribute it to their prayer meeting when really it's just something that happens at a random rate at all societies. And the ones who, what happens to after a prayer meeting think it's special for them when really it's just something that happens biologically all over the world. Well, if it happens biologically all over the world, I concede this is quite a bit less miraculous. I mean, I've had plenty of answers of prayer of, of things that are somewhat unlikely to happen in, in that moment, but they've happened in other situations. And that's, le that's less extreme of a, of a miracle for sure. So if you can provide evidence of this, that in 12 hours time, teeth turn 180 degrees um, without being punched in the face, then yeah, that will certainly take down the, the level of, of miraculousness involved here well i mean she could have like hit her hit her mouth while sleeping or something like on a on the desk and that could have done it too so yeah. punch in the face is an option here maybe her mom went and punched her <laughs> yes also helped option helps out the lord a little bit first of all she drugged her up so she wouldn't wake up maybe her mom should be into orthodontics Anyhow, um, there's something else I wanted to talk about. Oh, Pascal's wager. So mo moment of honesty here. So I, I already alluded to this, but when I, when I had my first podcast and I debated atheists and hosted debates and I read a lot of apologetics books, I, I concluded that the evidence for Christianity, the rational apologetic style evidence is not a slam dunk. Like, I don't think that you're unreasonable for being an atheist if, from, from that standpoint. 
However, I don't think the arguments against the evidence provided by Theus is a slam dunk either. I think there's some pretty good arguments from Theus, whether it be the minimal facts arguments about the resurrection or the Klom argument. Um, I, I think those are some compelling arguments, at least with the limited amount of research I put into it. So it, hypothetically, if it's a 50-50, and it's not for me, I, I, don't, I don't even know how to put a, a number on that. But if it's somewhere close to a 50-50, this is where um, the, the, the utility of Christianity for me would come into play, but also Pascal's wager would come into play. Like if I'm wrong, it's, it's not great. If I'm, but if I, if I um, anyhow, you all know what Pascal's wager is. Um, I'm having a Joe Biden moment right now. Um, but so that's where I'm at personally. Like I, I think you've had some good rebuttals to some of the things that I've said tonight. Um, but at the same time, like, <laughs> you're, you're clearly way smarter and you study this all the time. So it's, first of all, it's not a fair fight. When, when I do see a fair fight, like if William Lane Craig was, was debating you right now, and for someone like me looking on, um, it, it doesn't, to, to me, it doesn't look like a slam dunk for either of you. And I think a lot of people who are cheering on their fa favorite atheists or favorite apologists are kind of fooling themselves when they say that it is a slam dunk. They're like, um, because they want the, their arguments to be reinforced. So if, if we're looking at it that way, that's where Pascal's wager would come in. And that's where like the utility of the worldview for me personally would come in. Um, so that's why at the end of the day, I'm still a theist. So the way I understand Pascal's wager is that uh, if you believe in your right, you go to heaven. If you believe in your wrong, you turn right. to nothingness. And if you don't believe and you're right, you turn to nothingness. And if you don't believe in your wrong, you either go to hell or you, you nothing happens or you turn to nothingness or something. But to me, I think that's not a false dichotomy. It's It's a false dichotomy because... Um, there could be other things other than a God. Like there could be an afterlife without a God. You can have rewards without a God. You could have uh, Hinduism, reincarnation. So there's lots of different other options there. And belief in a God only seems to have a one in infinite chance of being right. Because maybe if you believe in God and the universe is such that anyone who believes in God goes to hell or something, then you would actually get punished for believing in God. And maybe the, the true afterlife or the true reincarnation only rewards you if you're an atheist or if you follow the evidence wherever it leads kind of a thing. And so to me, I don't see the probabilities as being any different. If you believe in God, you are both equally as likely to get a reward and equally as likely to get a punishment or nothing as if you believe in atheism. To me, I don't see why uh, belief in one would have a higher likelihood of success than another. Okay. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about is nihilism. So what causes you as an atheist or what keeps you from slipping into nihilism? Like, why does it matter that you're right? Like it, this, the fact that you happen to be born with a higher than average IQ, you happen to be born in the 21st century where atheism was even an option and you've been provided the education that you have, it, it, like randomly by chance, you became an atheist. Like, doesn't that strip the meaning out of out of having concluded the true worldview a bit? Like, does, like why 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 does it even matter? Uh, I'm not sure. Like, I'm not a nihilist. I believe in value and purpose and meaning. Most atheists do. Like, if you check the um, Phil Survey's paper poll of the philosophers 2020, it shows that 70 percent are atheists and 65 something percent, 66 percent believe in objective morality. So as an atheist, I still believe there's meaning and purpose. I'm not a nihilist. Most philosophers aren't nihilists. Um, but it, did I come to it by chance? Maybe. But I don't think there's a problem with that. Like, I think that I've been trained to follow the evidence as much as I can from my philosophy background. And because I value following the evidence, the thing that gets the best evidence is the thing I'm going to believe because I'm determined to. I'm determined to follow whatever the evidence is. And so since I don't see any evidence of a God, I'm determined to not believe that. I don't think that's a problem, though. It's like a calculator is programmed to do one plus one equals two. And if it gets to two, then it gets the answer. So I don't see that as a problem. Did you think William Lane Craig has some sort of biases or external motivators that keep him from following the evidence where it leads? Yes. I mean, I think most people do. Um, I okay, think everyone do does. More overwhelming than yours? 
Probably, yes. I think that he probably has religious experiences. I think I've heard him talk about those, and those religious experiences definitely shape the way he believes things. And since I don't have religious experiences, I don't have those same <clears throat> priming in the brain to accept those kinds of a things. So I think so. And you don't think the suffering that you experienced primed you to not believe in God in, in the same sort of a way? Uh, not to the Christian God, for sure. Definitely primed me against the Christian God. But well, that's what I'm this, saying, yeah. But not necessarily like a God in general. So it didn't prime me against the evidence. It just primed me against believing it's moral. So even if, if there was more evidence, I'd still believe God existed. I just dislike him a lot. So the my depression... I don't think it would prime you to accept evidence against the existence of God more readily? I don't think so, because I stopped believing way before I started doing any philosophy. Uh, it didn't have anything to do with my researching into the evidence. So I don't think so, because I think my standard of evidence is novel testable prediction. And so if, like, uh, God came down and wrote his name in the heavens, that's evidence. If he, if he did any yeah. scientific research, like the best example of evidence for God I've heard is from Hindus, where in the Bhagavad Gita, it predicted the age of the earth was 4.3 billion years. And it's that's really, really close. So that's real evidence for the Hindu God. But I think it's just a lucky guess. But if there are lots of those examples... That would be good evidence. So I'm definitely open to real evidence, but it has to be actual evidence, and I don't think there is any. So do you think most atheists are less biased and more open to the evidence, and that's why they're atheists, or have higher IQs, and that's why they're atheists? What I, do you think is the differentiating factor here? I definitely think those are big parts of it. Like, there have been a number of studies <laughs> on... Heard it here, folks. Yeah, well, these are there are studies that actually show this. Like, the that, atheists are smarter than Christians. Yeah, the six IQ points. There's actually a measurement for exactly what the are average. These Western atheists or global atheists? Global, like Asians are actually do better on IQ tests than Americans. Well, that's probably true. So, uh, yeah, I think it's. I, I also pulled this up in my debate with King New Boomer, which is the same one with the Pew Surveys data, which is that I, atheist IQ is like six points higher than religious IQ or something like that. Um, so yeah, that is definitely a thing. Uh, this is, the humility is just oozing. Your... It's just it's just a fact. Like it's the, what no, the data no, says. So so someone with a higher IQ than you, who is a Christian, the only reason why he's not an atheist is because he has stronger biases than, than you. Uh, no, I don't think so. Then what are the reasons why he's not an atheist? Probably has personal experiences or some really a huge emotional connection. But it's that a bias? That's what I'm saying, a bias or emotional connection. So the only reason someone is not an atheist is, number one, they're dumb, or number two, they're biased. Yeah, I think it's the only reason people are religious is because of emotional reasons. I don't think there's logical reasons that lead to religion. Okay, that includes every apologist. Yeah, pretty much guaranteed. Like, I've talked to many of them that usually have personal yeah. experiences. Is the atheist version of presuppositionalism? <laughs> Well, sort of. It's not an argument. I'm not, I don't use this as an argument against Christians, but it seems to be the case that, yeah, most Christians are Christian for emotional reasons. All right. I guess this is your version of insulting. <laughs> well, I, I don't mean it as an insult. I think it's true, it's though. Called, get called a dumbass. Um, I think that that's all my notes. Do you, do you want to go anywhere else? Um, You mentioned... The Kalam, and there was one other one. You said there were there were good arguments or worth considering. Seeing you said the Kalam, and one more right before you said the Kalam. Oh, do you remember what it was? Because it was before but resurrection. Re resurrection. Yeah, the minimal facts, the minimal facts approach. So, the minimal facts approach and the Kalam. From my perspective, I don't think either of those are good evidence. Like the Kalam says. Um, Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. The universe has a cause. That's the first half, um, which I don't think that indicates God. I think it's like a quantum field or something. So I agree with that part. And then Craig says the next three premises, which are um, something before the universe must be spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. And the only spaceless, timeless, immaterial things are minds and abstract objects. Now that part I would say is probably wrong. Like there's no evidence that minds are immaterial. Um, and there is lots of evidence that space and time emerge from like a quantum field, Hilbert space, that kind of thing. That's the consensus in physics. So I think that even if we grant the first part of the Kalam, 
the second part seems incorrect. And so I don't think that that's good evidence of a God. It seems to be more like evidence of quantum fields or something. So I don't think that's a good argument. Yeah, I'm certainly not prepared to defend Kalam, but you, you you said you don't think that there's anything immaterial that you could call the mind. Yeah, to me it seems like yeah. just matter matter stuff. So consciousness, like how would you explain consciousness? Uh, an emergent property of the brain. Um, there's a really good conversation between Philip Goff and Sean Carroll on this topic. Yeah, it just seems like consciousness is just an emergent property of the brain. So with with resurrection. Um, why do you think that that or, or do first of all do you grant that the disciples were willing to die for their faith? Sure. Okay. So you 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 grant that they were fully convinced that Jesus had bodily resurrected? Sure. Okay. Why do you think when they had the experiences that they later interpreted to be the risen Jesus that they believed that it was a bodily resurrection rather than just some vision? Because they they had a category for visions that would bring them comfort and and that sort of thing but they would still conclude there was a failed messianic project whereas if they and, and I, I don't i don't think they were idiots like i don't think that um they would I, I don't think it would be too impossible for them to differentiate between a vision and a bodily resurrection yeah i mean i think they did experience that it's called a bereavement delusion a bereavement delusion is a thing we know about that happens to like 60 percent of people they will see they here and touch dead loved ones. Um, and that's a thing that happens to lots of people all over the world. So I think they probably had a bereavement delusion for someone who was really important to them in their life. And so, and since they, we didn't know about those back then, they probably did think it was literally a bodily resurrection. So are there group um, bereavement hallucinations? Yes, there are group hallucinations. They're called folie yeah, adieu. Group bereavement hallucinations. Yeah, it's just any kind is yes. So you hear There's voices. But not. But are there examples of group bereavement hallucinations? Yes, there's, there's all all hallucinations have group and individual kinds. They're both. It's called folia du. Okay. Like, do you have a citation for examples of group bereavement hallucinations? Uh, yes, there and are. If there's like examples of of people all believing they saw married together, for example. But are there examples of people ha having those hallucinations together about a lost loved one? And yes eating with them and touching them and that sort of thing. Like the sorts of things that were recorded in the gospels where Jesus ate with them and um, invited them to touch his hands and his feet and basically provide proof that it was actually a bodily physical resurrection. Yeah. Because like, it seems like the gospels go out of their way to, to provide evidence that it wasn't just a hallucination. Yes. Which so say it was, was put in there after the fact, but then why would they be willing to die for that? Well, so bereavement delusions are actually really common, especially in very religious and spiritual societies. And so they'll see their grandma or whatever uh, who died. They can hear her voice. Um, and if they're in a very, very emotionally challenged state, they will they can say things like she came and ate with us for dinner um, and stayed and comforted us. And that's the thing that people have claimed all the time. So bereavement delusions are pretty common among people who with a recently dead loved one for all kinds of things and including groups. So we, okay, well, I mean, I would need to see a citation of examples of like a group of 12 people touching their deceased loved one and eating with them. Like that would be the, that would be what we'd need to have evidence for. Do you have examples of that? C D G. Complicated grief disorder. Can grief cause delusions? Yes. Mm. I definitely know what's happened for many people. So we know all hallucinations can be shared. It's called fully ado. So Funny. what we need to what we need to have examples of is uh, a group of people who have had multiple experiences together, where they had physical interactions with their deceased loved ones. Well, again, so since we can, we know this happens for every kind of delusion or hallucination, just finding the examples would just take some time, but yes. So maybe you can pin those examples to the top of YouTube if you find them later, because I haven't seen those examples. Uh, generally, what the way this discussion goes is 
oh, hallucination. Oh, there's no such thing as group hallucinations. Oh, you know, seeing Mary in the clouds. Well, that's different, you know. Um, well, what, well, there's we there's definitely such thing as group group hallucinations. It's called folia du. It's We literally have a name for it. Sure, and I, I grant that. What, what I'm saying is for the equivalent of this would be a group of people having physical interactions with the deceased loved ones at multiple times and not being able to, like, as a group, come to the conclusion that, that this was not real. Where this happened three or four times, and they were not able to come to the conclusion that this was not real. Well, again, there's lots of accounts of that in all kinds of religions all over the world, so it seems pretty common. Um... Generally, people are not willing to die for that sort of thing. Sure they like are. If you, if, if, if you would put a shotgun to their head and say that unless you deny that, you, that this person was actually physically with you, like that's generally not... People are generally... People are willing to die for their faith if they only if they sincerely believe it was real. And this this faith happened to be built on experiences where groups of people claim to have um, encountered, you know, physically encountered a bodily resurrected Jesus. Well, sure. But if they thought he That's was like, literally God, it makes sense that they would die for him as opposed to someone who saw their grandma probably wouldn't die for they'd that. Only, belief, but... They'd only believe he was literally God if they had had these group experiences together with him afterward. Right. And I'm granting those. Those I think those are bereavement delusions. I think they happened. But the fact that they're willing to die for it doesn't mean anything. Because if you saw a bereavement delusion of someone who you thought was God, you're more likely to be willing to die for it because you think you're going to have an afterlife than if you had a bereavement delusion of your grandma. So the fact that they're not willing to die for it or no one tried to kill them for it. Resurrection uh, was what convinced them that he was God. They were ready to, to sure. leave him after the crucifixion because they thought he was not God. So the resurrection, you're kind of begging the question there. The resurrection was was what convinced him, convinced him that he was God. Right. That's that's the bereavement delusion. So when they saw him come back, they believed he came back, and that was a bereavement delusion. And so the fact that they're willing to die for him doesn't mean anything. Like, of course, if you thought God himself revived uh, in front of you, even if it was a delusion, you would be more likely to give your life for that belief rather than if you just saw your grandmother. If you saw your grandmother revive from the dead, you probably wouldn't be willing to die for that belief because it's no, not like... I get that. I, I guess what we would need to see, what we need to admit is either that this only happened one time in history or that it's happened before, but we just don't have it documented or you would be able to provide some documentation of this, like the equivalent of this happening. Um, so if you can find that, if you can pin it to the top of the YouTube comments, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. There's tons of examples of groups claiming to have seen dead loved ones or uh, spirits or ghosts. Group group hallucinations happen all the time. So we'd um, have we'd have to have multiple experiences like this that convinced the, them that he was a lot that this person was alive, not dead, and have had physical interactions with this person. Yeah, that would actually go against their expectations because people like the Jews were not expecting. Uh, a resurrection in this in this way they were expecting a resurrection at the end of time where everyone was resurrected well the expectation doesn't make a difference bereavement delusion happens whether you expect it or not so hallucinations don't the matter expectation, the expectation makes a difference if you're less likely to expect this due to the religious context you're going to believe it less likely you're going to be more likely to be like no we're just i'm, I'm sure they i'm sure they knew that that people saw things back then in the same way that they knew it know it now maybe they didn't have the same kind of like way of describing it but i'm i'm sure that they realized like like if someone was having a hallucination someone would be like look, look you know that's not real i'm sure that, that happened back then as well which is why it's less likely that a group would have multiple um, of these experiences that are strong enough to convince them to die for this person even when this resurrection went counter to their religious expectations that's just like not what I see when I when I re research psychology. That's not a thing. People not expecting something in society and seeing it happens all the time. I don't. The fact that their society would expect it, it didn't it make a difference. Makes it less likely. Makes it less likely. Not really. So, sure, it does. If you're, no. If you're less if, if 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 marginally less likely. I mean, if I'm less likely to expect something than I'm and and it happened, and it's a, it's something that I would already be predisposed to be like, okay, yeah, that probably wasn't real. Then of course you're less likely to believe it. I don't think so. So like there's societies all over the world who don't expect things and then they see visions and hallucinations and then believe those things like aliens. We're, we're trained to not expect aliens. People see alien um, abduction visions or hallucinations all the time and they believe it 
even but though they're trained not to. My argument is that if I if I believe in aliens and I have an experience that I think is is an alien, I'm more likely to believe that that experience was an alien than if I did not believe in aliens. And so the, the Jews were not expecting a Messiah to resurrect before the final resurrection, which makes it less likely for them to believe that Jesus was actually resurrected. Marginally, I guess, in a very small way. But again, since Jesus said he was going to rise, probably the opposite, they were actually expecting it. So they're more likely to experience it. They, they didn't get it. They clearly didn't understand his teachings when he said that. Maybe. Like they were devastated when he died. At least if you take the gospel accounts at face value. Well, sure. Which you know, if Jesus, Jesus predicted his resurrection, then that kind of flies in the face of your worldview. Right. That would be evidence if Jesus, pre, pre, like. You just, you just said that he predicted his resurrection as part of your argument. Yeah, I just don't think he actually resurrected. So if he actually resurrected, that would be great evidence for sure. <laughs> well, you can't have it both ways is my point. Uh, right. I mean, I, I agree. So if he predicted his resurrection and he actually rose from the dead, that would be evidence. If he predicted his resurrection and people had bereavement delusions, that would not be evidence. You were using his prediction of his resurrection as part of your evidence against my argument. Right. But I, I assume you don't think he actually pre predicted his resurrection. Do you think he actually predicted his resurrection? I, I guess so. I tend to grant it. It's in the historical document. I don't, I don't know if the historians think that part is authentic or not, but I tend to grant it. Okay. Okay. Crazy coincidence that someone would predict the resurrection and then the world's largest religion would, would arise out of the claims of that resurrection having happened. Uh, I don't think so. I just think it's just basic probability. Like you could say that about literally any statement, any religion ever made. Crazy coincidence that this one religion predicted the age of the earth was 4.3 billion and it was the largest religion in the world. Like maybe it's just any, any statement that it makes, which corresponds to reality would be seen in that same way. And so any statement that a religion makes would probably be taken to be evidence when it was really just a statement. I don't see that. Okay, well, if, if, if you find the examples of the equivalent of this happening, then then definitely post a citation. Sure. So we got two citations needed so far. Yep. I, gave, I posted the one about the teeth thingy, the paper. So I can't get access to it. it what? You didn't look at it to see if it was 12 hours. Yeah, I can't get access to it because it requires a paywall, but doesn't actually, it would seem... be actually more like seven hours knowing how much my wife sleeps. I don't know if that would make a difference. Probably would. <laughs> I don't, that's almost half. Well, because it... it You'd also have to take into the time it took her to get to the doctor because it wasn't measured until no, she got to the doctor. No, no, no. She saw it as soon as she woke up. Maybe. Time. So we need, we need, let's, let's go for seven hours now. It doesn't make a difference. Spontaneous uh, remission is a thing that happens all over the world. It wouldn't be. I have a feeling if I said it was one minute, you'd be like, oh, happens all the time. I have this article that has the word spontaneous in it. <laughs> well, so anything that can be explained by a God can be explained by an unknown natural cause. So it's not evidence of a God until you actually can demonstrate it in a lab, like novel testable predictions. So all of the things that people claim are miraculous, yeah, those can be explained by an unknown natural cause just as well. So, yes. So if I had an amputation and it grew out on camera, you'd be like, oh, unknown natural explanation. Unless you could do it again and prove it, yes. No, if I could do it again and prove it, you'd be like unknown natural explanation. No, no. If you can make novel testable predictions, say like every time you pray to a God, he'll grow back a limb. And only when you pray to a God, that's good evidence. But if it just happens, that's right. not. Right. So if right now, if right now I would say as proof of God's existence, my head is, my head is going to roll off my shoulders and it's going to come right back on my head. And I did that. Would you be like uh, a natural or, or sorry, no, that, that counts. That's a novel prediction. So if you predict the future, so you have yep. to predict it first. Yep. What if I wouldn't predict it and would just pray and it would happen? I didn't predict it. I just prayed and it happened. Uh, isn't that a prediction? That's what happened with Brenna's tooth. Like she didn't predict it. She just prayed and it happened. Right. Uh, yeah. So praying and then it happened is something that happens all over society. It's, uh, okay. 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 So if I would pray right now, I wouldn't predict it. I would pray that my arm was going to fall off and then come back on. You would say, oh, there's some kind of natural explanation for that that we don't know yet. Uh, yes, until unless it happened repeatedly at the praying thing. Like if you prayed again and it didn't happen, and it was only that one time, it's more likely so some I flew, unknown. If I flew to wherever you live 
and came up to your front door and prayed, Lord Jesus, decapitate me and have my head come back on my head. And it literally That's a prediction. A that's, a, that's a prediction. No, that's not a prediction. That's exactly what my wife did. She just prayed and it happened. What's your definition of prediction then? Because that's the exact same thing that Brennan's mom did. Prediction is saying, um, I believe hypothesis X. If hypothesis X is true, here's something we would expect to see. And then you do the experiment. And if that's what you see, that's evidence. So what your wife did would count as a prediction. If you'd say, I believe in God. If I believe in God, it's going to heal me. Obviously, pray to God. I believe in God. All right. that was great. So I'm not saying any of this. I'm not coming up with some formula. I'm just coming to your doorstep or someone you don't even know walks up to you at Walmart, doesn't even address you, doesn't make all these fancy predictions, just starts praying, Jesus, decapitate me and put my head back on. It happened. And what Tom Jump says is there's an unknown natural explanation. That's what you said earlier. Unless we can repeat it and test it again, then it's probably some unknown thing. Just if it happens once and just once, that's not evidence. It's never, ever evidence if it happens once. So, so it has to be repeatable. Happened, if this happened, you would stay an atheist and, and you would not become a Christian. Yes, because if it happens once, no one should believe it ever. It's completely irrational to ever believe it if it happens once. Okay, it's so only rational if, if you can test it and repeat it and show it happens again and again. Then it's rational to believe. <laughs> okay, that's that's pretty intense. I'm not sure that um, I'm not sure anyone's going to be able to make a Christian out of you in that case. If if someone literally coming up to you praying to Jesus that they would be decapitated. Having it happen, the head rolls around on the floor, comes back onto their spine. If that wouldn't convince you to to take seriously the claims of Jesus, then I'm not I'm not sure anything would. That's that's pretty extreme. Well, that's a pen and teller trick. So they can literally do that. And if you were convinced, it would be not a smart thing. You should never be convinced by that. You should only be convinced if it can be done in a testable environment that's repeatable that you can show it's not just something you don't understand because it could just be something you don't understand. So in order to do that, it's got to be repeatable and testable. Just one really strange event happening should not ever convince anybody. It should just be like, I don't know what happened. We should do more investigation to figure out what it is. And then if after the further investigation, you find out when you pray to God, this happens and it happens only when you pray to God and under no other circumstances. Yes, that's very good evidence. All right. I mean, like if Penn and Teller... I was going to do the whole decapitating thing, but apparently it's not going to work. So. <laughs> yeah, like, decap- like Penn and Teller could do that. I mean, if Penn and Teller did the decapitation trick in front of you and said this was Vishnu, would you convert to Vishnuism? So who's this magician who's being decapitated? Penn, Penn and Teller. Um, there's How two. do you spell it? P-E-N-N and T-E-L-L-E-R. So he decapitates himself. Well, that's a, that's a fairly common uh, thing in magicians. The decapitation is that's a common one. Okay. So uh, to stretch the analogy further, if this was if there are claims of this happening all around the world, um, would that would that change your mind at all? Yeah, if it was a testable prediction, we could repeat it and say, if I pray to God, here's some weird event will happen, and only when I pray to God, then yeah, that's evidence. Because I have uh, pastor friends from India who have tons and tons of stories of this sort of thing happening. And if you look at the, the scriptures, this sort of thing happens more where the gospel is being proclaimed in territory where it's not yet reached. Like that's generally the pattern we see. And so that's something we see in, in today as well, where like these guys tell me these stories as if it's like not, not even unusual <laughs> Um, really insane stories and Hindus like I've heard stories from Hindus as well where you know they went and prayed in the, all these different temples and finally went to the Christian church and prayed and immediately were healed um, and they'll tell me that, and then that's why I converted like I've heard so many of these stories happening so I guess that would be like I mean that's not as extreme as decapitation but if, if your requirement is that this would happen in multiple places throughout the world I, I think that's certainly happening with miracle claims Sure, and that would definitely be evidence if m- more miracles were happening under Christianity, but every time that's been investigated, they've been shown either to be mostly false, like pretty much all of the claims have been shown to be false. Like there's a book by Craig Keener. He has like a 500-page tome of all of the biggest miracles, the ones that can be have the most evidence that he's ever found. He's a Christian, so he's arguing for Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. And 
all of these examples have been proven false scientifically that they're just not real. There's no accountability, doesn't work. Um, so all of the, the studies that have been done on miracles, which there have been a lot of them by many religious, like the Templeton Foundation, to try and show that this is the case have been proven false. All of those accounts, especially in third world nations, all, have been... All of Craig Keener's accounts in his 500-page book have been proven false. No, they just did the best ones. They took like the best examples he gave, tried to... Uh, validate them and show that they were false. So like one of the ones was that he gave an example of this uh, woman who was had a cardiac arrest and she went out of body experience and saw a VIN number on the top of a ventilator and the VIN number was correct. And when the investigators investigated the claim, they found that there was no hospital given, no doctor given, no person's name given. Um, this was all from a, a person, from one professor in one college, and there was no corroborating evidence. Secondly, there are no VIN numbers on top of any uh, medical equipment because the VIN number has to be at the bottom so that, or the middle so that the infector can actually read it and inspect it because they all have to be inspected. So all of her things have been proven false on like that one. That's the one I can remember. The other one was like a red shoe one. Who's what? determining that these are the best ones of, of, in Craig's book? Like it feels I didn't. Like this was this was a study. Worse. I didn't do these. This was some other other people were doing the studies on these. Okay, and you just trust them blindly that they pick the very best ones, and these are the examples they're giving. That's typically what you do in scientific research to try and corroborate data. Yeah, and, and since atheists aren't biased, that I'm sure they they were accurate in picking the the, the strongest ones in his book. Mm -hmm. Typically, yeah, that's how science how scientists do things. Like, if 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 they picked the wrong ones, Craig could have said, "No, those are the terrible ones. Do these instead." He could have. He, like, he and read Craig's it. Craig's not a scientist, so he didn't put he he produced garbage work. But that wasn't one of his objections to the paper. He didn't say, "No, these are terrible examples." He said, "Yes, these are good examples." But so his objection wasn't, "You picked bad examples." What? Craig Venter read read the paper that these guys wrote. He didn't say, Craig, "Oh no, these are straw men. These are not good examples. You should have picked uh -huh. these examples." Oh, did he respond to yes. their arguments against the examples? What did he say? I don't remember exactly, but he didn't respond with that. Okay, well, maybe we should look at his response then. You can if you want. Okay. Did you read his response? Yep, yeah, long time ago. Okay, and it was garbage. I, d I didn't find it compelling, but I don't remember what it was. Gotcha. All right. Do you want to become president? I saw on your YouTube channel that you're trying to become president. Yes, I think that would be a very good way to help improve people's lives uh, by lowering the cost of living. It definitely helped like, to make the UPS like the way it was, uh, savings and load bank to... Um, decrease the cost of living by doing lots of different things that we can do to improve the economy. What's your path to the presidency? Path to the presidency? Uh, don't you gotta, don't you gotta start working the system now? Well, I guess not if you're Trump. Yeah. So yeah, become billionaire. That is path. Step one, become billionaire. All right. Good luck. Thank you. I, I, I need vote. it. I don't vote out of principle, so I won't be voting for you. Me neither. I have never voted. Has not occurred. Fantastic. I'm glad to have a fellow Christian anarchist on board. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we've been going for about two hours. I really appreciate you coming on. It was uh, pleasant talking with you. Um, would you like to tell anybody where they can find your podcast and places they can check out your stuff? Yeah, it's called That Jesus Podcast. It's on any podcast platform. We talk about spiritual formation and Christian mysticism, prayer, mission work, um, and hot button issues like critical race theory um, and lots of other good stuff. Awesome. Thanks again for coming on. Really appreciate it. And I'm going to start the after show so you can just close the window whenever you're ready. Talk Sweet. to you later. Thank you. Bye. All right, guys. After show time. Oh, thank you for the super chat. No time to be president when you are running the game in bathtub sales industry that's correct the bathtub sales that's where i that's where i i really shine in my bathtub sales buy your special t-jump bathtub today and where's the pnr the pnr 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 do i have a room in pnr now i think i should t-jump server 
locked. I wonder how that works. Thank you for the super chat, Ethernet. Appreciate it. Invite people. Go. Taco. Let's, um, drink. Not, even, not on my friends list. I'm very bottom somewhere. Derp a derp. Thank you for the super chat, Frank. Known you for three years, you have entertained me and have been one hell of an inspiration. Congrats on the 10K. Thank you, Frank. Appreciate it. I'll do the pink hair thing next week, probably. <sighs> How's it going? Danny. Might try going back to the politics server. More people there. Mm. all right i'm gonna head off guys and get some dinner i'll see you later